I know a lot of you are probably mad you didn't get to see him yesterday, so you get to see him now. There he is. There's Jaw, investigating the yard. Well, hello, my friends. Your old pal, Jordan the Lion. Well, today is going to be a great day because we have an expert accompanying us on today's vlog. We're going to head down to Cincinnati, and my grandpa and I are going to be doing the vlogging today. So we're going to first head over to my mom's house. Jaw's going to hang out there and play today. Then we're going to go meet up with my uncle. Then we're going to head to Cincinnati. It's going to be an action-packed day full of stories about one of the most popular people in this state and a man who, I mean, he, he calls himself the most winningest athlete of all time. And I'll tell you why he is the most winningest athlete of all time. Days with Jordan the Lion begins now. Well, hello, my buddy. Everybody wants to see you. Come on, jump. There are the cornfields. This time of the year, you can get some great sweet corn. They're usually selling it all over the place. You see signs off to the side of the road. There he is, riding shotgun. Papaw's got his James Dean jacket on, his Rebel Without a Cause red jacket. Now, I believe I've shown this before, but this was one of my childhood homes can't really see much but that's it so this little house was my dad's house I mean this was our family house but when my parents got divorced my dad lived here and I have a lot of memories this was his last house here my love for 80s horror movies came from this house we used to always go to the video store every Friday when I was staying with him and he would say one horror movie and one comedy looks completely different it never had that stone work in the front but that was his place. He used to ride three-wheelers all over this property when they were still legal. My dad got them for us when I was probably four or five, and that was our pastime, was just riding all over the property, up and down. There were hills and everything in the back, and yeah, looks nothing like it did. This used to be a field that was owned by our neighbors, and uh, he used to let us ride our three-wheelers through there. Wow, look at the clouds. I was gonna say, I think it's safe to say when he starts scratching at the ground, what's gonna happen? Rolling around in the leaves. All right, next stop, Cincinnati. There's Jesus. Touchdown, Jesus. Welcome to Cincinnati. Well, my friends, you're looking at a section of the Ohio River. A river that separates Ohio from Kentucky and at one point where we're at now was called Anderson Ferry and Anderson Ferry unless you wanted to go five miles down the street to cross this is how you got your car from Ohio over to Kentucky now in the 1940s there was a young man who was here taking and collecting the money and that's how he'd make a little bit of cash as a young boy that man's name was Pete Rose and Pete Rose became one of the greatest baseball players in the history of the game and yet today many of us may know he is still not in the Baseball Hall of Fame. Now Pete Rose's dad is credited by Pete and everyone that's ever saw Pete play as being the man who really made Pete who he was. He drilled into his head that you were to put in a hundred percent you were to do everything as hard as you could, as determined as you could, and you were to play as hard as you could, and if you didn't, you shouldn't be out there. In fact, he would always tell Pete, what you do is a reflection of me. So if you don't hustle when you're out there, if you don't take it seriously, you're embarrassing me. And Pete said, that was a good father. That's the way you were supposed to be, he said, because he did it the right way. He made me want to be a better player. He made me want to do more. And because of that, Pete Rose, who was not the best uh, athlete of his day, although he did play every single sport because his dad played every sport. His dad was actually a, uh, they didn't, Cincinnati didn't have a pro football team at the time, but he played semi-pro football, he played basketball, he was a boxer at one time, he played baseball, he was just an all-around sportsman, and he had that fall over onto his son, and Pete would say, my dad was a great athlete, but he said, I think my baseball talents came from my mom's side. 
And that's actually how Pete ended up becoming a Cincinnati Red and a professional baseball player. So we're gonna head over and I'm gonna show you Pete Rose's boyhood home, the family home that he, his mother, and his three other siblings grew up in. It's still there. And I'm gonna tell you a few more stories out there. Now Pete's history was basically, for the most part, right here on River Road. So here in this house was Pete Rose and his family's family home. Now Pete's brother said in our neighborhood, your grandpa owned the house, then he gave it to his son, and then he gave it to his son, and that's the way they all went. And Pete's father, when he was in Little League, he was friends with Don Zimmer's father, and Don Zimmer was the professional athlete here. Before Pete was playing in the majors, Don Zimmer had been drafted and was playing, well, he was a backup for the Dodgers. So Pete said he and his dad would go to all the games at Crosley Field for the Reds, and his dad would impress upon him how important it was to hustle and play hard, and Pete did that. So once he started showing a little bit of talent, his dad went out and uh, he said, one of the funny things was he only saw his parents have one argument, he said, and it was he was supposed to, his dad was supposed to buy his sister, Carol, some new shoes, and when he came home, he had boxing gloves for Pete and said, it's summertime, she doesn't need shoes, this boy's gotta learn how to defend himself. And so his sister would say, they would, uh, every night after dinner, they would go out back behind this house and they would play baseball. And she said, dad would sit and watch and he would always tell Pete what he did wrong. There was, if there was anything that he could improve, he would always tell him, you know, you gotta do this, you gotta change this. And his dad knew what he was talking about. He was, like I said, four sport athlete and he actually played professional, well, semi-professional football over the age of 40 and they said even then he was one of the best out on the field so pete's dad worked with him throughout his youth and once he graduated they said he didn't really get scouted for baseball but pete's uncle was a scout for the reds and he got pete a tryout pete made the team went to the minor leagues and then had two great seasons and when they finally decided to call him up and he walked in the clubhouse. The manager said, who are you? And he said, I'm your new second baseman. And the other players said, you know, we loved Don Blazingame, who was our second baseman then. So there was no way Pete was gonna win this job, but he came out there and this guy who they nicknamed Charlie Hustle just outworked everybody. They said he would get walked and he would go full speed to first base. And Pete said, my dad told me to do that. He said, quicker you get to first, the quicker you get to second, which means that quicker you'll get to third and the quicker you score. And that basically became Pete's entire philosophy for playing was win at all costs. And because of that, Pete also would worry or at least focus on most of his stats. He wanted to break records and he said, as long as I'm breaking records, we're gonna win. As long as I'm getting hits, we're gonna score runs. And so Pete's goal then became, I wanna be the first singles hitter to make a million bucks. And he did. So right down the street from here, Pete actually had a baseball field that he used to play his little league games on and we're gonna head over there. We'll talk a little bit more, but I wanted to start here because, man, the guy is, I mean, when I was a kid, Cincinnati Reds baseball was like almost like, I would almost say it was the most important thing as far as entertainment in our family's household. And when I heard the name Cincinnati Reds, I just thought of Pete Rose because he was our manager, he was our player manager. He had just broken the record for the most hits of all time. It's crazy, the guy had been three-time World Series champion and he says, you know, that doesn't matter. I played 21 years and I only won three championships. That means 18 years of failure. And if you ask a lot of the guys that played baseball at that time, you say, who was the best player you ever saw play? A lot of them would say Pete, and they'd say he wasn't the fastest, he wasn't the strongest, he wasn't the best at a lot of things, but this determination just made him almost superhuman, just made him one of the greatest on the, the field. And my grandpa got to see a lot of those games what would you say, Papa, about Pete Rose, just watching Pete Rose as a rookie all the way to the end of his career? 
He just had a determination that no other ball player had. And that kind of rubbed off on his teammates because he played for, as he says, I'm not going to say it's the best team of all time, but it was definitely the most exciting team of all time, the Big Red Machine. And he was so well respected that when Sparky Anderson of the front office was thinking about trading for a player, they'd pull him and the other leaders of the team like Johnny Bench, Tony President, say, what do you think of this guy? Now one of my favorite stories was something I've heard two or three players, actually I've heard Carlton Fisk tell a version of this story and I've heard Sparky Anderson tell this story and they said it was about game six of the 1975 World Series. One of the most competitive games that's ever been played in a World Series and they said that when Carlton Fisk hit that home run Pete had the biggest grin on his face and Carlton said, I'm rounding first base and Pete is smiling going, man, isn't this fun? This is what we play for, Fisky. This is why we do this. And he's sitting here thinking, I mean, this guy's out of his mind. I just hit the game winning home run and he's saying that. And Sparky Anderson said the same thing. He said, he said, we're walking off the field and Pete goes, man, Skipper, isn't that the best game we ever played? And I go, I've always known you're insane, but you're proving it now because we just lost game six and he goes, yeah, but we're going to win tomorrow. Who cares? Even Carlton Fisk said, Pete said to me, enjoy your game tonight because we're going to win the World Series tomorrow. And that's just the kind of player he was. And the very next night, they did in fact win the World Series as well as the next year. And there's the backyard that Pete would have been playing uh, baseball after dinner in. It's kind of hard to believe that the, one of the greatest players to ever play baseball grew up in just a little side street behind River Road back here. So if you leave Pete's house and you walk basically right around the corner and across the street, we actually get to exactly where Pete worked, the Anderson Ferry Boat Dock. Well, where they uh, bring the cars off and on and you can see that a boat just landed so they still do it. So this is exactly, right here is exactly where Pete Rose, as a little boy, would have been collecting those quarters to let people go across the ferry right over into Kentucky. And my grandpa was telling me, he said that the reason that uh, the houses, like Pete's house, is built kind of up on hills because the Ohio River was known to flood all, I mean, even flood River Road. And so um, when Pete signed his deal and started making some money, um, and became a, you know, he was Rookie of the Year in 1963 for the Reds. Um, he bought a house on the Kentucky side overlooking the river. On our way here, my grandpa was telling me that this, uh, this river was well known for like Daniel Boone, Davy Crockett, people like that. And we just noticed that the, uh, the boat that is taking the cars across is actually called the Little Boone. So from here, Pete's house was actually right over here. That's how close it was. He could just walk across River Road. And look at what's on my grandpa's jacket. Big Reds fan there. Right up there you can tell it's no longer 25 cents. Now five bucks to take your car across. Well we've made it to Pete's Park. The fields, the two fields that you see in front of us for where Pete Rose honed his skills as a young baseball player. And boy did he ever. We're talking about a guy who, like I said, called himself the most winningest player in sports history. And he's pretty much right. If you look at 21 seasons that I played, you played minimum was it 170 something games, 172 games a year in the season. Then you add in playoff games, uh, world championship games, world series, and just any of that stuff. According to wins, nobody has won more games than Pete Rose. And when I told you that he prided himself on his stats, he set a lot of records. One of my favorite stats that he mentions is that in his career he played seven different positions during gameplay and was an all-star in five of those positions. He said he was actually drafted as a catcher and yet never caught. 
when he came up for the Reds, he was first their second baseman, and then he said, every time I was asked to move positions, he said, Sparky would just say, hey Pete, I need you to go play third base. And I'd say, okay, Skip, when do you need me to do it? And he'd say, Wednesday. Giving him no, no time to learn the position. He would also play all of the outfield, outfield positions. He would also play first base. And uh, Johnny Bench tells a really great story in one of his interviews where he says, uh, he remembers when Pete played center field one time. Pete was not known for, um, he was known for being great at a lot of things, but not his arm. That was not one of those things he was known for. And he said, I remember Pete trying to throw somebody out at home and it was a 17 hopper. <laughs> now I showed you when we walked in that now uh, this park, it was always called Bold Face Park. And uh, now it's a Cincinnati Reds field, Bold Face Park. But at one time they changed it to Pete Rose Park and in honor of him. And the reason that they changed it was because of unfortunately the hot water that he was getting into. Um, as many of you may know, he had this fantastic career and as my grandpa was telling me, he said, you know, he kind of learned the gambling from his dad. Apparently his dad was a big horse racer uh, or a horse gambler, gambled on horse races. And he would give Pete the money as a little boy to go give to the bookie or whoever was placing the bets. And I guess that just, Pete being a kind of an addictive personality and like I said, having to win, as he would get this money as a professional baseball player, he would not only amass many, many girlfriends and buy extravagant gifts on top of the fact that he was already married, uh, but he would indulge himself in gambling because he liked to win. And they said what was interesting about him is he couldn't win at football, but he almost couldn't lose at baseball. Now when Pete was accused of this, he denied it. And they investigated his phone records and they found that he, he had done it. And for 20 years he denied it, which many say that was, that was the real reason why he was never put in the Hall of Fame. He was never able to be voted upon and probably never will be because one of the big rules in baseball, and it was uh, a plaque that would be right outside of every clubhouse before you went in was no gambling. And so many of the players that are Hall of Famers now, they feel that Pete has besmirched the game and that um, he's brought shame to it and they don't want him in there. And then you have other players that say, you can't have a baseball hall of fame without the greatest hitter of all time. I fall into that category. I say, for me, what he did on the field is, you can't take that away. And to have a baseball hall of fame without a guy who hit, you know, broke a record that was set at 4191, that's unbelievable. Now I'm going to read off some of Pete's accomplishments and I'm going to let you think about what you think. Do you think this man deserved to be in the Baseball Hall of Fame? A hall that honors the greatest players of the game? 17-time All-Star out of 21 seasons. Three-time World Series champion. National League MVP, World Series MVP, National League Rookie of the Year, two-time Gold Glove winner, Roberto Clemente Award winner, three-time National League batting champion. His number's retired for the Reds. He's in the Reds Hall of Fame. He has a statue at the Reds ballpark. And as far as his major league records go, those were just accomplishments. He actually has the record for the most hits of all time, 4,256, the most career singles, the most career games played, which falls into line with why he's the most winningest player ever, because he's played the most games as a baseball player ever, the most career at bats, and the most career plate appearances. That means, as a leadoff hitter, he was getting on so much that he was getting up to bat at least four or five times a game. Now, Pete would say, without a great team, he wouldn't have been a great player. He would have been a hard hustler, but it takes a great team, and he had a great team. And most of those guys now are memorialized with statues over at Great American Ballpark, and we're gonna go see those now. One of the great stories, though, is they have captured Pete in one of his most classic 
poses. Pete was known for going head first into home plate, winning at all costs, like I said, and one of the most famous instances of that was during an All-Star game, one of his friends was actually the catcher for the American League while Pete was on the National League. Pete's rounding third base, coming in home, it's a close play, and Pete completely barrels over his friend, dislocating his shoulder. After the game, Pete's wife said, what is the matter with you? He's our friend. How could you do that? It's an all-star game. Pete said, that's right. It's an all-star game. You think I don't want to win that? You think the people that paid to come see this didn't come to see a great game? No, he said, that's what baseball is about. It's about winning. If you're blocking the plate and you don't have the ball and I'm coming after you, that's trouble. So now we're gonna head off to Great American Ballpark and I'm gonna show you what a man who they said was never the greatest in anything, but he became the greatest. Where that work ethic leads you to. Now Pete has always been known as Charlie Hustle and that's a name that his teammates gave him his rookie season because they kind of thought it was goofy that he was running full speed to first base. But like I said, he was taught to do that. And so as they would mockingly call him, hey, Charlie Hustle, he'd say, that's right, I'm Charlie Hustle. He was proud of that name. And he said, one time I was playing a game and he said, my dad came to all the games. He said, and my dad watched every single thing I did. So I didn't want to embarrass him. And he said, I remember one time Four at bats in the game, he said, I didn't get anything to hit. And uh, one of the times I was kind of mad at myself for, for not swinging at the one good pitch that came down the pike and I'm running down to first base and didn't think much of it. He said, and after the game, I walk out to my car and my dad's standing out there and he said, I thought, oh my God, something must have happened to my mom or something, something must be wrong. And he said, my dad's standing out there and he says, let me ask you something. That second at bat in the fourth inning, when you were running to first base, did you run as hard as you could? Pete said, I thought about it for a second. I said, no, no, I didn't. He said, how you play the game is a reflection on me. This is my city. Don't ever embarrass me again. And he said, I knew what he meant. And he said, dad looked at me and said, now I'll see you tomorrow. And he walked away. And Pete said, I always thought of that. And when Pete broke the record, hitting 4,192 hits, he said, he looked up in the sky and he saw his dad's face. His dad had passed away in 1970 and Pete broke the record in 1985. And he said, I saw my dad's face and I started crying. And little Pete came out and hugged him and said, my dad, my life, I'd never seen him show emotion. I'd never seen him cry. And he also really never hugged me. And he said, after that, every time he saw me, he hugged me. Downtown Cincinnati in front of us. Kind of makes you think of WKRP, doesn't it? Don't worry, I'll vlog that on the next trip, maybe. Well, here we are. Great American Ballpark and the Cincinnati Reds Hall of Fame. Well, my friends, welcome to Cincinnati Baseball. This is not the park that Pete Rose played in. Pete Rose originally played in a place called Crosley Field, which is no longer there, and then he played at Riverfront Stadium, which is also no longer there. But he was inducted into the Hall of Fame here. Now you can see right in front of us is one of his teammates from the Big Red Machine, Tony Perez. And then right over here in the most classic of all poses is the great one, Pete Rose. A man who accomplished about as much as you could accomplish and he accomplished almost everything he ever set out to accomplish. I guess other than being in the Baseball Hall of Fame, the only other thing that he said that he did actively try and do that he didn't get to do was he was trying to break the all-time hitting streak record, which was set by Joe DiMaggio at the number 56 games in a row with a hit. Pete said he got up to 44, and then the pitcher refused to give him any fastballs on that 44 or 45th game, and it ended there. He said he was furious. Now, one of the other things about Pete, some people say, well, yeah, he couldn't hit any home runs. He only had 160 home runs in his career, but that was by choice. He was taught to be a singles hitter. He was taught to be the man to get on base. And so 
There's a famous story where one of his teammates said, Pete, you can't do home runs, you can't hit them. And so Pete said, oh yeah? Watch this. That game, he hit three home runs. Now this is, this was Pete Rose's most classic pose and he did this all the time. Coming in head first. Now they try and tell kids not to do that because they'll break bones and have injuries, but in Pete Rose's day, it was win at all costs. Winning was everything and winning was the most important thing. Man, what a great statue. Now on the ground over here, fans when they were building this were able to buy a brick to be put down and my uncle was telling us at lunch that uh, my grandpa's name is actually somewhere right over here by this statue. So I think my grandpa's over there looking for it right now. To me, Pete Rose embodied what being a baseball player was during his career. Uh, despite the fact that he was suspended for 30 games for pushing an umpire, which other guys had done, he really on field exemplified what a hardworking baseball player was and for that reason I wanted to do this vlog and I do think it's unfortunate it is his own fault but I do think it's unfortunate that he is not in the Baseball Hall of Fame but like he said I'm in the Reds Hall of Fame and that's just as important because he loved this team he loved these fans and as long as they appreciated what he did and all the effort he put in he's happy Wow this place is amazing. At some point we will come back here and I'll vlog the Hall of Fame on the inside and I'll probably come to a game here and I'll vlog that as well. The season's now over. But I love what they're doing here. I love this. Well, he found it. There it is, Don Cress, loving father and grandfather. Well, we're gonna call it a day here on this part of the vlog. Now let's head back to Dayton and go see the Joster. Hope you guys enjoyed this. And that's where the Bengals play, Paul Brown Stadium. Who day? There he is. There he is. There's the Joster. Hey, we, we, we.